Thank you for coming to this talk and not one of the other amazing talks that are also in this slot. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, all right, let's get started. So uh, my name is Arthur Doler, or Art, and I'm a software engineer. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a therapist, anything like that, but I love brains. Not in any real weird creepy way or like zombie way, but I love thinking about brains and learning about brains and taking what I learn about them and converting that into things that we can use to build software, to better build software and to work better together. So with that said, let's start with a story. A long, long time ago now, uh, I used to work at a company in Omaha, Nebraska, which is where I'm from. And it was a defense contractor. So we had, or we had offices, rather, pretty much all over the United States, anywhere mysteriously that there was also a major military base, like a naval base or an Air Force base. And that meant that we had a bunch of people that I never saw. And this was before remote working was relatively common. So we didn't, you know, we have periodically we would have meetings with each other. And I was working on an internal framework, an internal library in Java for a bunch of these other people to consume. I've, through the whims of fate, found myself the tech lead. And we had, every week, a meeting between our internal framework team and the leads of all of the teams that were required by company policy to use our framework. And this was more intended to be an informational meeting. It was intended to be something where we turned around and just said, hey, here's what we're doing, here's kind of where we're fixing, where we're going with this. And I had a coworker who lived in Hawaii, so I already didn't like him. <laughs> Mostly I was jealous. And his name was Jim. And Jim decided to start this particular meeting by immediately derailing whatever I was going to say and launching into a tirade about something that he particularly didn't like in the framework, something he was using, only his project was using, and he didn't understand why we hadn't fixed it or made it work the way exactly he wanted it to work or so on. And I responded by telling him that he was an idiot, because that's what I thought at the time. And I said, Jim, what are you doing? This isn't making sense. This isn't a meeting. And he responded by saying some unfortunate things about my parentage. And I responded by saying some unfortunate things about his mother. And things went south from there. And we ended up spending about an hour, more or less, yelling at each other on the phone. With the benefit of hindsight, I asked myself, what the hell happened in that meeting? Why did things go so wrong so quickly? And I've done a lot of thinking and a lot of reading about this, and my answer is that your brain happened to you, or my brain happened to me, and Jim's brains happened to him. And this happens to all of us all the time. Because a human being is a social animal. We exist in this framework of social networks, of social connections, and these are extremely important to us, whether we realize it or not. These relationships, though, aren't just with our friends, with our family, with our social groups. They are with our coworkers. We build social relationships with our coworkers. And these social relationships, like it or not, make up a big part of who we are as a person. They affect us dramatically and they shape how we think. And then our brain shows up and just decides to go hog on all of it. and can make complete messes of the relationships that we spend a lot of time trying to maintain. So today, we're gonna talk about how to get rid of that, how to avoid some of those things. We're gonna first talk about the walled garden and the dark forest. And then we're gonna talk about what a cognitive bias is. Then we're gonna talk about some debiasing techniques you can use. And then we're gonna talk about a couple specific cognitive biases and how to use these techniques to diffuse them. So let's start off with the walled garden and the dark forest. Because we tend to think, especially in this modern age, that the brain is the be all end all of the, or like the human body. It's the thing that rules everything, right? And it's funny because you go back into human history and the Greeks thought that the heart was the seat of human reason. And the Egyptians who practiced mummifications for you know, centuries upon centuries thought the brain was so important they basically just yanked it out through the nasal cavity with a hook and then just threw it away. But we think that the brain is important. And it is. But it's not as important as you think it is. So let's talk about that walled garden and the dark forest. 
I want you to envision this garden in the middle of this dark, scary forest. And it has very, very tall walls. And your conscious self, the self that you think of as you, is a resident of this garden. And it's really, really nice there. There's all kinds of fun things to do, fun things to see and enjoy and tend and grow. But it has really, really tall walls and you can't get outside of it. Because conscious intentional thought is actually a fairly small portion of all of the things that your brain does. This is the intentional self. This is the self you think of as you, that you embody as yourself, that you think of when you are engaging in a cognitive, logical task. Outside of the walls of that garden is the dark forest. And the dark forest is everything else that your brain does. All of the other processes that are running, all of the other things that keep you and have kept humanity alive for as long as it has. And the things that live out here, this, is the autonomous self. The self that kind of runs on its own that you're not necessarily aware of. And the key factor here is that you can't see outside of the garden walls. Your conscious self cannot see what's happening with the autonomous self. It has no direct visibility to it. And so that leads to this weird little interplay because all your conscious self can do is kind of yeet messages over the wall of that garden and something back there will yeet a message out back. And you can read that and you can look at that message, but you don't really know how it got that message. And you don't really know why it said the things it did. The vast bulk of what goes on in your brain is not conscious thought. It is autonomous processes designed to keep you alive and designed to help you navigate a world without having to think about it too much because it takes energy to do that. You are not in the driver's seat of your own brain most of the time, but you really think that you are. And the fact that you think you do, that you think you know what's going on in your head, is the introspection illusion. What are called the antecedents of your behavior, the things that lead you to behave the way you actually do, are not largely visible to you. But you spend a lot of time thinking that it is. And this is the introspection illusion, because you really, really can't. Trust me, I feel like I can. Even knowing all the things I do, I go, yeah, sure, I know why I behave the way I behave. But logically, if you look at the results and you look at the studies, we don't. Here's an example. Let's say a message comes over the wall. And when a message comes over the wall, your conscious self, your intentional self, can look at that message and choose to analyze it, all right? And you can sit down and do some logical things and saying, okay, let's talk about if avocados are overrated, right? They've got all these pluses, they've got all these minuses, yes, no, here's the pros and cons, going through all of this. But this actually takes a lot of energy. In terms of your brain, it takes sugar because that's what your brain is largely powered on, right? That's what our systems are powered on. And it takes a lot of thought to think consciously and cognitively. And our brains are wired to save us energy because we grew up in an energy scarce environment. You know, you can go down to Taco Bell and just get 7,000 calories of whatever you wanted. We had to go hunt it, we had to go grow it, we had to go eat the find and food. Also, trying to do this process causes what's called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance is this feeling you get when you try to hold two thoughts in your head at the same time that don't really mesh with each other. Your brain doesn't like it. It's uncomfortable, it's awkward. And so we largely don't do it. So for example, let's say you don't like avocados. You and your autonomous self do what's called confabulating, right? You start from the assumption that what the autonomous self has handed you, which is a message that says avocados are overrated, is true. And then you work together to effectively build a story, a narrative around it. So you could say, I don't like avocados because avocados are kind of slimy and every time I eat them, I feel nauseated. And so I just don't really like avocados. And all of that can be true, but there can be a real story behind it. For instance, the first time you had an avocado was at Walt Disney World when you were three and you ate avocados and it was 110 degrees and you got heat stroke and you puked avocados out of your nose in a Disney World bathroom. 
You don't remember that story. Your parents absolutely remember that story, but you don't. All you retain is this somatic experience of associating avocados with nausea that has lasted you until your adult age because that's an autonomous process that's running in your brain. The fascinating thing about seeing the rise of all this AI happening and chat GPT, et cetera, is it does exactly this. It will never tell you, I don't know. It will turn around and just make some stuff up. Which is funny because that's actually what human brains do. All of this is compounded by the fact that your autonomous self is largely running the show and your intentional self is basically an exception handler for that autonomous self. If you don't believe me, let's try this. Think about driving to work or taking, you know, whatever transit you do to work or walking to work. How many people have ever arrived at work and you do not remember the journey to get there? You should look around the room. That should be terrifying. But it's not because that's how our brains work. Our autonomous self turns around and says, okay, go think your big brain thoughts. We got this. I know how to drive. But you bet your ass that if you saw an elephant on the way to work, your autonomous self is going to go, excuse me, uh, I would like some assistance here. I was not prepared for this eventuality. We are an exception handler to our autonomous processes. When something is novel, when something is different, when something is complex, that's when the autonomous system tags us in. And in fact, a lot of what we do when we're not working on something consciously is we think about future scenarios, right? We go back to this, you're thinking about the tacos you're gonna make for dinner. You're thinking about the stuff you're gonna do at work. You're thinking about how to get to an autonomous state within a lot of your other tasks. And when we're tired, when we're upset, when we're emotional, or when we're busily thinking about something else, we are way more likely to automatically accept the messages that are coming across from that autonomous self. And that really is not terrible most of the time. That autonomous self devolved for a reason, to keep us alive, to help us navigate a world without having to think too hard, too much. And the dark forest is full of all of these other processes going on. It isn't just a single self. It's really a bunch of these different selves. And they're a howling parliament of voices. They howl for your attention. They try to tell you what things are happening that they think are important or that you should be paying attention to or all of these things that are occurring to help keep you alive and keep you moving. But they're not meant for the age in which we live in. The human brain evolved in a very different scenario than we are in right now. These are from an older, darker time. These are wolves. But thinking about it like this, can be a little problematic. And so to help clarify and to really bring some anthropomorphization into the process, I tend to think of my autonomous self as a hyperactive border collie named Noodles. Now, Noodles is a very good boy, but cognitive biases become a result of hardwiring in the autonomous self, usually to save energy, shortcuts that we take paired with us not paying attention with what's coming out of that autonomous self. It's really kind of this dance that we do together. And it requires inattention or effort on your part to do this. Now, cognitive biases are not logical fallacies, all right? Logical fallacies are errors people make in reasoning arguments and in formal math and formal logic. It's also not a cognitive distortion. A cognitive distortion is a term used in uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to represent a particular brand or slice of thinking that can lead to emotional problems like depression or anxiety. And it's also not a social or an implicit bias. Social biases are specific to a time and to a place. And they're specific to you as a human, right? Cognitive biases are common to all humans. To every one of us, we've all got the same wetware running up here. And I mean that. They are common to all humans. You, all of you, even the you, the people in the back. And me, okay? All of us. And I mean all of us. If you're sitting here listening to me and breathing and thinking, you also exhibit these cognitive biases. I actually stopped talking about this for a long time 
because I had conversations after talks that went like this, where people would say, thanks for the talk. And I'd say, yeah, thank you very much. For, I'm glad you liked it. They turn on and say, yeah, my particular, you know, whatever relation or coworker, et cetera, does that one bias all the time. Okay, look, I mean it. All of us exhibit every cognitive bias. It isn't that we forced in, we're forced into the wrong decision all the time. But it, this is the way that our brain tends to work when we don't override it, when we don't examine the situation and go, oh, no, wait, that's not right. And there's been, since 2011, this cavalcade of books that have traded on the existence of cognitive biases. You could argue that it started with Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, which was 2011. And since then, there have been a bunch more. And since 2011, we've basically had this wave of people going, great, the human brain is broke, we're screwed. We're irrational and you can't stop it. Luckily, we have had since relatively recently, I think this book came out in 2020, um, a wave of studies starting to happen that show us how we can provably work to counteract some of these biases. Not to prevent them, but to compensate for them. To catch these biases happening inside of your autonomous self and in the interaction between your autonomous self and your conscious self and go, wait a minute, hold up. We're going to adjust this. Or to train some of the responses coming from your autonomous self because you can do that. Noodles can get trained. But on the other hand, you can't just think your way out of cognitive biases. There's no real sitting there and going, yes, we'll never do this again. I've had conversations with coworkers sometimes where they turn around and it's like, oh, okay. Well, I just won't do that anymore. That's not how it works. It's going to happen. And it's going to take energy, time, and effort to avoid these things, to compensate for these things. So we're going to walk through some techniques um, that Gleb Sapersky actually pulls out in his book, uh, The Blind Spot, or The Biases Between Us, rather. Excuse me, blind spots between us. This one. He lists a number of these. Um, these are even, aren't even all of them. He lists a whole bunch of techniques that you can use to defeat cognitive biases, to counteract cognitive biases. We're going to go through some of these, and then we're going to talk later about how to use them for specific cognitive biases. So let's jump into these. The first of them is identifying biases and figuring out our plans to deal with them, right? Everything really starts with knowledge. You can't work with a library in your software job unless you understand what that library is for and how to actually use it, what its API is. You can't train a dog without knowing how dog brains work. So similarly, we have to understand how our autonomous self functions so that we can turn around and counteract it and compensate for it. And some of that is going to be identifying where the pain points are, recognizing where these biases crop up in your life, and turning around and saying, boy, that sucks when that happens. I don't want that to happen ever again. And using that pain as fuel to help you get over the burden of effort. The other tech, or the next technique rather, is delaying our decisions and reactions. Because we tend to want, especially in this day and age where it's, we have to get stuff done, we know, get the next ticket across, finish the next thing, answer the Slack thing, answer this email. We have all of these stimuluses coming at us constantly. And you need to learn to slow down. Move fast and break stuff may work in Silicon Valley, but it's not going to cut it here. You need to turn around and actually learn to count to 10 again, like you're in kindergarten. If you're having an emotional response, give yourself 10 seconds before you respond. If you need to make a decision, take 30 minutes before you respond. Because 30 minutes is the amount of time that it's going to take for your parasympathetic nervous system, what's called the rest and digest system, to kick back in and put your sympathetic nervous system, which is the fight, flight, or freeze response, and kind of get it to calm down. Because when you're emotional, when you're upset, when you're anxious, when you're overly tired, that sympathetic nervous system is really kicking in. If you're feeling overwhelmed at work and you just want to get that task off your list, that's the sympathetic nervous system. You want to fight that task, check. So slow down. The next technique is probabilistic thinking. And I promise there's not going to be a ton of math here. 
Look, that, that's it. That's the math. That's all the math. Probabilistic system, or thinking rather, trades on the fact that Noodles is not very good at math. He's not great with numbers. He's really more of this yes-no attraction aversion system. And your conscious self, on the other hand, your intentional self, can be very good with numbers. Not all the time. But really, when people talk about probabilistic thinking or Bayesian reasoning, they're talking about what's called base rates. And what this means is, how often does a thing actually happen? Not how often do you think it happens, but how often does it actually happen? So for example, how many people have ever gotten a Slack message like this, or in you know, Teams or whatever you use? Yeah, my brain, literally every time, that. Just, well, pack my stuff, I'm done. But you know, um, I've never been fired from a job. I've never been fired from my current job, I guess self-evidently. And in fact, if you look at the number of times that I've even been in trouble, it's maybe two times out of 60 times this happening my entire career. And that's a generous 60, right? It's probably closer to something double that, which just shrinks the percentage. The likelihood that I'm even in trouble is 3%. The likelihood that I'm getting fired is 0%. I've never been fired, so it's never happened. But my brain tells me it's going to happen every time. Looking at the base rate of something and actually determining how often it actually happens can help you override that emotional response from noodles. You can also try to make predictions about the future. If you are encountering, well, you can use this actually as a way to get around Bayesian reasoning because it can sound really hard and sometimes you do have to do all of the listing. Just try making a guess. Next time you're worrying about something or even hoping about something, and you think maybe this particular future will come to pass, write it down, make a prediction. And I do mean write it down because your brain will conveniently forget that you were wrong if you don't. It's handy that way. You ever wonder how people can get up on TV and be like, yeah, this is gonna happen with a political situation and then it doesn't and then somehow they're still there the next time a political thing happens? This is why. Write your prediction down. And then when the event comes to happen, you know, when things happen, Check your prediction. Did it come true? If it didn't, maybe you need to adjust those base rates. Maybe you need to turn around and say it's less likely that this thing will happen. You can also consider alternative explanations. If you have a negative interaction with somebody, all right, maybe it is you. Maybe they don't like you. But there are a host of other things that could be going on, right? If your boss turns around and you're supposed to have a meeting at 3.30 and they send you something at 3.29 that says, sorry, couldn't make it, things came up. A noodles, at least for me, is going to turn around and be like, oh, oh, they don't like you. You're in trouble again. But there's a bunch of different reasons why that could happen. My boss has kids. Those kids have problems. They have, you know, um, they have cars. Cars have problems. They have jobs, lives. Problems are endemic to the human condition, and things are going to happen. So, there's a bunch of different reasons what could be going on. They could be even just so buried in work that our little, you know, weekly tack-up is not worth the time right now because they really have to get this done. Now, you could argue, should they have put that in the message? Probably. Note for the future for other folks. But they didn't have to, and it's not about me. More often than not, it's not about me. People are all wrapped up in themselves most of the time and thinking about themselves and all the things they have to deal with rather than about you. But you should check back later. Circle back and verify your prediction in the same way you do when you're predicting things. You can also reflect on the future and on repeating scenarios, all right? Using past patterns of behavior to determine what's likely to happen in the future. If you have a coworker who is constantly committing the cardinal sin of microwaving fish in the work microwave, and you've asked them before to not do it, and they keep doing it, what do you think is going to happen if you ask them again? Nothing. That's the pattern. So unless something has meaningfully changed, either in the person or in your relationship, then it's not likely to be useful to tell that person again, please don't microwave the fish. You can also try considering other people's perspectives. What are their other needs? What are they looking to get? Because each one of us really walks around 
as the hero in our own internal story. Nothing wrong with that. That's frankly how you get out of bed in the mornings. It's the way our brain is wired so we actually feel effective and useful. But everybody's got that internal story. So how are they the hero in their story? Work to frame it in their context and their perspective. If you've ever heard the phrase, assume good intent, this is kind of the same thing. Where you turn around and say, well, okay, from their perspective, how does this look? Are they operating in good faith? And working from there. You can also try getting an uh, external perspective. Because sometimes in the heat of conflict, in the heat of engagement or discussion with other folks, our scope tends to narrow quite a bit down into, oh, I have to win. I got to win this thing. But we can't see that. And bringing another person can help point out things that you literally, your brain will not let you see in that moment. You can also set a policy to guide your future self. In the moment, it's really tough to remember any of this stuff. If you're having a tense discussion with your coworker or with your partner, it's real hard to remember that you should stop and breathe. It's real hard to remember that you need to think about, oh, how are they the hero? And so you can set policies for yourself, guidelines for yourself to help constrain you in the moment. Some of those can be external decision aids, but some of those can be things that you just know you never violate this rule. For instance, I like Legos. I really like Legos. These are all the ones I have up at work. But I have a rule that I don't get to buy them. My parents buy them for me for Christmas. My partner buys them for me. I get them as gifts for speaker stuff sometimes. I don't get to buy the little plastic blocks. The rule is there because I don't know where the bottom is if I start buying Lego. So it's easier to just say, I don't do it. There's a blanket prohibition. And every time a new model comes out, I look at it and I'm like, oh, that would be real cool. All right, well, I'm going to just gonna add it to my wish list. Because it's easier to, sometimes to have that absolute restriction than it is to try and find that balance, that gray area. You can also practice mindfulness meditation. Now, you've probably heard of this before and you've probably heard a bunch of people on TED stages or as thought leaders talk about mindfulness and make hand poses that look like this, they talk to you. But honestly, mindfulness meditation can be really useful. It can help you almost more than a lot of the other techniques we've talked about, focus in on that distinction between you and noodles between the intentional self and the autonomous self. It helps you realize when a rock has just landed over the wall versus a thought that you had yourself and paying attention and saying, oh, okay, I'm looking at this. And it unlocks the ability for you to actually say, do I believe this thought that my brain is having? Because it turns out you don't have to believe every dumb thought your brain has, which was a great relief to me because I have a lot of dumb thoughts. It improves your ability to cope with any cognitive bias. This is an across-the-board solution simply because of the awareness it gives you in that dynamic. And it doesn't take much to do either. Ten minutes a day can provably help improve your ability to combat cognitive biases. But there are a lot of cognitive biases to combat. I actually have this hanging outside of my cube. Um, my coworkers thought it was a, like about a framework at first. I'm like, yeah, it is sort of, we're going to talk about a couple of them today. We're going to talk about the halo horns effect and the halo effect. We're going to group some attribution errors together. Then we're going to talk about some weird stuff out of here. Uh, illusory superiority, curse of knowledge and gap of empathy. We're going to skip illusion of transparency for time, but let's talk about tribalism. Tribalism, humans group into groups, right? This is not shocking. And in fact, we do it pretty readily. Um, there was a paper, Social Categorization and Intergroup uh, Behavior, by Tajful et al. He ran, Tajful ran a whole bunch of experiments in the 1970s. Uh, he called them the minimal group paradigm experiments. And they were meant to show how easy and what made humans group into things. Now, Tajful actually was looking to figure out why genocide happens, which is a extremely broad and, and lofty goal. 
but he worked to figure out, okay, what is the minimal value here? Like, what is the minimum that it takes for a human being to decide to group up with another human being? And he ran this experiment where he took a bunch of students from Oxford and showed them a paper with a bunch of dots on it and had them say how many dots are on the paper. Then he took their result and he basically threw it away and flipped a coin. And based on the coin flip, he told them, you are either an overestimator or an underestimator. So he's created this thing where they believe there's a psychological concept called overestimator or underestimator. This concept does not exist. It's not real. And he's randomly assigned them to one of these two groups. Then he handed them five pounds and he said, great, you are going to allocate this between two individuals. And he handed them two names, one of whom was an overestimator and one of whom was an underestimator. And you had to decide who got X amount of money. So let's review. You have a bunch of students who have been told that they are a thing that does not exist randomly. And then the key here is that these two people, neither of them exist either. They're completely fake. And all that this person knows about them is that they're an overestimator or an underestimator. And unilaterally across the board, people would allocate almost all of the money to the person in the same group as them. It doesn't exist. It's not real. We will do this at the drop of a hat. And we will form what are called these in-groups. Groups that we are in, as opposed to out-groups, which are groups that we are not part of. This tendency is at the root of a bunch of social biases. But it's not the same thing as social bias. These are kind of the underlying image. So they are the put the actual foot itself that is creating the prints of the actual social biases. Because the social biases will shift over time and over culture. Things about the biases we have against weight have shifted drastically over time. It used to be being overweight was seen as a, a great thing because you were rich and you thought people thought it made you sexy. Clearly not necessarily true in today's world. So let's talk about the horns effect. And let's start with another story. Uh, I had a tech lead once, name was Nick, and Nick liked to read blogs and tell you this is how we should be doing Agile. I didn't like Nick because Nick had also decided that the way of the future was Google Dart. Anybody remember Google Dart? Exactly. And Nick decided that he was going to start doing improvisation exercises, so like improv comedy exercises at the start of every retrospective. And I said, that's great. When you want to start the actual meeting, I'll be over here doing it. real work. I didn't like Nick. What's funny is I give a workshop about giving and receiving feedback. And do you know what I do at the beginning of workshop, that workshop? I have the attendees do improv exercises because it's a really great way to kind of pull people out of their shell and get them thinking about other human beings. Nick didn't explain that, and I didn't like Nick, so it was an easy answer. This is kind of the horns effect, and the horns effect says if we don't like a person, we actually rate them lower across the board on all of their attributes. If we don't like one thing about them, if they're in one of our outgroups, we rate them lower on attributes like skill, on employability, on how much we should be paying them. And this can be for a lot of things. It could be, we don't like the way that person's accent sounds. We think they're ugly. We think they're overweight. Anything that will get us to start thinking of that person is bad. So what do we do about this? Well, we delay our reactions. Take a delay before you judge new people. Allow yourself to sit with that person and actually understand something about them and mentally keep that judgment in check. Because remember, we tend to undervalue overweight people, disabled people, people with foreign accents. We can also try making predictions about the future. Write down your gut feeling to check the accuracy. If you get to know a coworker and they are all excited about Google Dart and you say, wow, this person's an idiot, write that down on a piece of paper and maybe you're right, maybe you aren't. Maybe they're just misguided. They're certainly not right about the Dart thing. <laughs> At least with the benefit of hindsight. You know, will they actually be bad at coding? You don't know. You're going to have to find out. The counterpart to the horns effect is the halo effect, and it works much the same way, except in the positive sense. If we like one aspect of someone, we will rate them higher across the board. This is traditionally used when we are attracted to someone. If you think somebody is attractive, they are automatically smarter to us. We should be paying them more. They're better athletes. They're better politicians, etc. 
and we attribute that to all, we add that bonus to all of their attributes. We can solve this particular one by reflecting on the future and on repeating scenarios, all right? Think about a different world in which this person is not attractive, is kind of a weird alien that, you know, it's weird to think about, but try to yank yourself out of the situation that is real and put yourself into an imagined one and say, well, how would I think of this person then based on their behavior? Or you could just simply ask yourself, have your opinions on the people you like always been valid? Mine haven't. You can also try setting a policy for your future self. Before you start hiring, establish metrics that you'll use to judge people. And those can be either qualitative or quantitative. And once you've assigned those numbers, adjust them by about 30% if you've liked them. That's about the quantitative value you see. There's also attribution errors. Let's talk about attribution errors. The first of these is the fundamental attribution error. So let's have one more story. Um, I had a coworker once, his name was Josh, and Josh used to fall asleep at work. And I don't mean like cute, like head back. It was full on snoring. And we made fun of the guy because why not? It was around the time Diablo 3 came out and we're like, oh, clearly he's just up late Diablo, playing Diablo 3. Who does that? Who does, you know, who comes into work and just snores the whole time? But none of us ever asked him, hey, is something going on? Are you having a problem? Is there anything we can do to help? I don't know why he slept at work. And I never will know now. Noodles holds a model in himself of your world. That's part of his job. That's how he makes decisions so fast. This allows us to arrive at those quick decisions. But it's an approximation of the world. And humans are extremely complex. And we can't really hold people in our heads. And so we take shortcuts. And the fundamental attribution error says that my behaviors are due to my surrounding circumstances and your behaviors are due to your inherent attributes because my things are obvious to me and your things are not obvious to me. So it's because, you know, you are lazy, right? I overslept due to insomnia. I had a poor coffee experience this morning and I'm overwhelmed by job stress, but you are lazy, angry, and sloppy. And we see this happen all over the place. So what can we do about the fundamental attribution error? Well, we can start by delaying our reactions. Instead of accepting a noodle's answers, force yourself to be curious about that other person. Why are they like that? Why are they behaving this way? Is it due to this, you know, some inherent attribute? Or is it because of their circumstances? What's going on in their life that is causing this, if anything? You can also make a prediction about their future behavior. See if they'll repeat that behavior. The more often they do this, like for instance, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, right? If you see one person do it one time, this one person, okay, maybe they're on the way to the hospital. You don't know. You have plenty of other things about their behavior, or no other things about their behavior, rather. But if it's a particular car that cuts you off every day, I'm not sure how that would happen, but envision the scenario, then it's more likely that they're gonna do the same thing. It makes it more likely that they're a jerk and not on the hospital every day, unless it's an ambulance, in which case, probably on the way to the hospital. The second kind of attribution error is the group attribution error. And the group attribution error says, or it has two types rather, the first of which is, any member of a group I'm not part of is representative of that group. So for instance, the QA analyst on my team is a jerk and I fail my tickets for the most nitpicky stuff. So all QA are nitpicky jerks. That's the type one group attribution error. Type two says the group's overall attributes are representative of every person in that group. So for instance, if I view all sales staff as slimy weasels, then the new salesperson, I'm going to think they're a slimy weasel. Completely irrelevant and irrespective of whatever they actually are. This is the heart of stereotyping, these group attribution errors. And figuring out how to combat them can help you be more resilient to social biases. So how do we solve this? Well, the first and best way is probably consider alternative explanations. Remember, everybody else has circumstances. What is this person's circumstance? Maybe locking salespeople into a commission-based payment structure isn't the best idea because it results in behavior that we don't really like. You can also try getting an external perspective. Someone else, 
especially with a different background and help counter noodles. The last attribution error is the ultimate attribution error, which is really more about groups than the group attribution error is, but psychologists are as bad at naming as developers. The ultimate attribution error says that my in-groups attributes or behaviors rather, are because of circumstances. And my outgroups attributes are because of intrinsic behaviors. It's basically the same as the fundamental attribution error just applied to my in-groups and my outgroups. So QA often get paid less than developers for about the same number of years of experience. Now the ultimate attribution error says that's because they're less skilled because it's intrinsic, right? There's a behavior, there's a circumstance, and that is because of an attribute about that person, about that group. And that isn't necessarily true, because I've known plenty of QA who've gone on to become great developers. How do we solve this? Well, start considering other people's perspectives. What does that person think? What do they actually think? Where is they coming from? Can you be confident in your assumptions about their views? How many of that type of person have you met? How many of that type of role have you met? Are you confident that they're representative of all of them? How many things, for instance, do you think your QA knows that you don't? Answer is higher than zero, guaranteed. You can also try probabilistic thinking. What have your experiences actually been in the past? Do you have actual data to base this on? Are you just using noodles and assumptions to make your conclusions? The next cognitive bias we're gonna talk about is illusory superiority. Illusory superiority is hysterical, all right? I love this one. There is a University of Nebraska faculty study that was done in 1977, where 68% of the faculty rated themselves in the top 25%. And more than 90% rated themselves above average. I don't have to tell you that that's not how math works. We tend to believe we are better, smarter, more awesome than we actually are. Now, this is okay, because frankly, it gets us up out of bed in the morning. But it isn't necessarily true. And it can drive us to feel like we're better than our teammates, smarter than our bosses, and generally turn us into an asshole. This is the thing that kind of lets you read a couple blog posts or, you know, a couple books on psychology and decide that you're cool enough to give talks about it. And that can be really valuable, but it also, you have to keep in mind that it isn't necessarily always true. That little voice in your ear that tells you you're better isn't always right. So how do we beat this? Well, first is to consider other people's perspectives. Remember, other people are the hero in their own story too. How is that possible that you're both heroes? How are you both the champion here? And you can consider alternative explanations. What if you don't know more than your colleague? What if they actually do know more than you on this particular thing or on most things? What if Noodles is handing you things saying this design should be this way and he's wrong? What are the consequences of that? What would the outcomes be? And what can you do to double check? The next cognitive bias is gonna be the curse of knowledge. Your brain can't unknow a thing. It's this weird quirk that, of the way that our not, brain actually internalizes memories. You can't know what it is like to not know a thing anymore. And what that means is that it's impossible for you to imagine what, you, what it would be like to not know those things, especially the things you do the most. So when you teach people, this tendency leads us to actually teach people really poorly. We tend to get frustrated because we don't understand why this person isn't simply doing this or just doing this, or you only have to do this. And we push learners too far too fast. It's almost like we just climbed up this thing and then pulled the ladder up after us. And then we're yelling at people for not scaling this cliff unaided. Because you basically forget all of the steps that it took for you to get there. So we solve this by considering other people's perspectives, sitting down and thinking about what do they already know and asking them, what do you already know? And then we find out what the smallest possible bit of knowledge that they could know is. And then we figure out how to tie that into their existing knowledge. This is how we actually teach people. 
And this is why teachers are generally criminally underpaid because they have to do all of this all the time. The next cognitive bias we'll talk about is the empathy gap. You ever wonder uh, what happens in your brain when there's donuts in the break room? Because I do. That point when I'm like, ooh, donuts. And then three donuts later, I'm like, oh, what happened? It was like I blinked and I'm three donuts in. This is partially some of the, because of the evolutionary way in which we evolved, right? You know, food is free in some of these places. Like, there, you could go down and get snacks, right? Just as many as you want, I think. They'll just, you go back and get like 17 pieces of lasagna, I don't think they'd stop you. Maybe after like five, if you're going to the same person. But food is readily available to us, and our brain isn't really wired to work that way. We usually underestimate the effects of emotions on others and on ourselves. Emotions can be extremely powerful and they change how you think, like almost physically. Something that's not a huge deal for you can also be a huge deal for somebody else. And we underestimate those effects on ourselves. And this is called the hot cold empathy gap. So think of yourself when you are being chilled and calm and rational. This is the cold state. And you, when you are emotional and fired up and ready to go and the autonomous self is riding high, this is hot state. And the fascinating thing about the human brain is we actually view each other, like ourselves in these particular two states as two separate humans. It's almost like it's not the same us. Like we're strangers to ourselves. And we can solve this by considering other people's points of view. Try to envision what you'd feel like with their background and situation as much as you can. What things do you think are important to them? And what things do you think they actually want to care about? And do this with your past and future selves. Think about that moment in the break room where you know that Noodles is gonna be like, we should eat those donuts. And the conscious self is like, yeah, we should eat a donut. <laughs> but this can be a case too where you can use those limits. You can make predictions about the future. If you have a relationship with this person, predict what they're likely to care about based on what they've cared about in the past and anticipate their emotions when you're in a cold state. Sit back and think about how they're likely to be in a hot state if they hit an emotional hot moment. And you can set a policy for your future self and set those policies obviously when you're in a cold state. And absolute policies can be easier to hold to than fuzzy ones. If you give an inch, sometimes that hot state is going to take a mile. Sometimes you're like, I want the half the donut. Okay, I'll take half of that half. And then another half of that. And then now you've Zeno's paradox, the whole donut. There's crumbs left. <laughs> so normally this is where I would try and sum up, pull things together and review. But frankly, there's a lot here. And what's fascinating is that you are not going to gain much from just this talk. I've given you a bunch of toolkits and or tool, excuse me, tools in a toolkit, but you are going to have to practice them. You are going to have to consciously work with them and teach yourself to use them either in that autonomous state or when without thinking about it too hard in order to get the benefit out of them. The way that you become a good person is to do good things, according to Aristotle. The way that you combat your cognitive biases is by practicing to combat those cognitive biases so that you're ready in those moments when it happens. I actually do, I don't get paid for this, but I do recommend Gleb Sapersky's book. He has a bunch after each cognitive bias he talks about where he has a bunch of exercises where he explicitly says, put the book down and go write your answers to these exercises. And I really recommend that as a thing you can do. Or worst case, the slides uh, will be available. There's a link at the end of this. Go download the slides. Go back through this and think through these techniques and envision yourself using them and when you would use them. Being aware and being conscious of the reactions and responses that you get from the dark forest is still going to go a long way. You have to live with noodles. There's really no other option, all right? So don't let him sabotage the things that you love doing. Because together... And working together, you can sally forth and take on the world. So, thanks very much for listening. Are there any questions? Yeah.
No questions? There's one over here. Great presentation. Thank you very much. I just wanted to ask if the, the presentation is hand drawn. Yes. Uh, so he asked if it was a presentation hand drawn. Yeah, I draw all my slides. So. Really? Uh, they were, it was perfect. Thank you. Thanks very much. I actually draw them on Twitch. Um, if you're curious, I can give you a link to my Twitch stream. So. All right, uh, I'll be at the whole conference. So if you've got questions, find me at the rest of the evening or rest of the day and the, the following days. Um, and we'd have a conversation about it. So thanks again.